I've been excited to speak to Daryl Johnston since I was told he was going to be on. Yeah, mm-hmm. Daryl, it's David Sampson. How are you? I'm awesome, David. Hey, okay, so where do you have Dead Poet Society in your 100? Oh, uh, Dead Poet Society is in my top hey. 100. That is a great call, and that is a very underrated movie. Robin Williams, yeah. UFL Executive Vice President. I want to make sure we get this right. Are you going to stand on the desk? I was going to do it. I'll captain my captain. I would like you not to because <laughs> I don't want you to get hurt Thank on you. my watch. Thank you. Please, just stay in your seat. Well, I'm head of HR here, so it's fine. It doesn't matter. I approve this. Message. Yeah, he actually is. There's no way you're head of HR. <laughs> I do not accept that. Daryl, can we talk about yes. the UFL? Because you're the VP of Football Operations, and the debut has happened. The UFL, the interesting thing, the business side of the merger, but I want to go on field for a minute because it's almost like your league is a training ground for NFL rule changes. And so do you <laughs> feel that responsibility when you're thinking about your game that you actually are doing things that – are going to be across the entire industry of football. Well, we threw them a little bit of a curveball this year. Um, the the XFL style of the kickoff, uh, when we came together as a merger, um, we actually went with uh, the Uf- USFL style. So that that was a little bit of a curveball thrown. So uh, we just felt that that jumping from a traditional kickoff to the XFL style from 2023 was one of those quantum leaps. And how do you unroll that if, if you don't really like it, if it doesn't pass the test in the NFL after the one year trial? Uh, so ours is kind of that gradual progression. You know, we really take a kickoff and kind of turn it into a punt, but you're exactly right. It's an opportunity, not only for rules, uh, but for technology. I think one of the things that we had in week one was the true line component in our game uh, with the measurements. Uh, and a lot of people really like that piece of technology that we had, I think the transparency uh, with our command center, with with Mike Pereira and Dean Blandino, um, you can kind of get taken to the inside of that that conversation and and really kind of hear the why, which I think is something that uh, that fans have always wanted to be able to hear. So yeah, we, we're able to push the envelope a little bit more in some different areas, and and we've always gotten some really good positive feedback from the fans. Are your referees in a in a union? Are they unionized by chance? I would think so. I would think so. I'm not. I'm not uh, 100. What made sure, me but smile, Daryl? Dean Blandino is that we, one of the reasons why we don't let the the audience hear a lot of what goes on in replay or what, they don't like to be embarrassed by missed calls. So they don't want us, the umpires union doesn't want there to be a big focus when there's, a, when there's an overturning of a call. You're just supposed to move past it. Don't talk yeah. about it and just keep going. And a rule got changed where now the umpires can talk to the spectators and s- explain what's going on. Because one of the biggest issues has been that the fans, the audience, doesn't know, but the TV audience does. So you'd know yeah. more in the Fox booth. Yeah, I, I think the ability to own a mistake, having that humility, uh, we're not perfect. You know, you're going to make a mistake from time to time. And 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 those are few and far between when you talk about the officials. I, I think for fans to really to see what they're able to do at game speed and how fast that game moves and for them to be right 98% of the time when you're talking fractions of seconds, whether – it's a catch two feet down possession as he goes to the ground, all those things that happen so quickly. Uh, I'm always amazed at, at, at how often they're correct. You go back to replay and you see it, and you may have thought it was the wrong call, but it ends up being the right call. So uh, I, I think this is great. Our guys were fantastic in week one. I don't I don't think any of them have an issue where they may make a call that's that's not correct, and you get together as a group. And the most important thing is being right. And if you're not right, you've got to be able to have the humility uh, you know, to kind of go on to the next play, forget about that, and, and be better next snap. Nah. I love the concept of using replay to be right. I think yes. replay should be on every, there should be replay for every call. There's no reason. We have the technology. Especially the first down, two guys holding a chain 10 yards apart and then having the umpire <laughs> carry it, pinching it forward. It's preposterous. If you can do it with technology, I think that that makes the most sense. What else do we think can be replaced Tennis replaced all the lines, people. Is there a scenario <laughs> where there's one guy in a chair now during a tennis match? Is there a scenario where there's one referee on the field in football? I, I think if, if we do have a union, that's where the union's going to step in. <laughs> uh, they're, they're not going to let that one happen. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't want it to get to that point. I, I I grew up in the area where there or the era where there was no replay, so that human error was something that that you just had to accept. And and there's a number of games that that football fans can go back to through the course of history. And and those were some hard lessons where when you looked at the replay, you're like, well, that wasn't right. And you got to live with that decision that was made on the field. So I've always 
I've always accepted the human error component. Uh, I think perfection is something you strive for, but you're never going to attain. So I, I think trying to find that balance, that right balance between having, you know, the officials on the field, uh, having the ability for replay to step in when necessary, especially if it's a game-changing play or it's going to flip something. All of a sudden, you've got a team that doesn't win a game, that doesn't make the playoffs because of a, a call. That those are the tough ones. And when we can when we can step in with technology in that in that area, I think it's a, it's the it's the right thing to do. But as EVP of football operations for the now merged UFL, don't you want to eliminate all errors? I assume one of your goals is on field to make it perfect to show the NFL and to show your fans that we're going to have a product here that is beyond reproach. I think we're, we're trending that way. We, we, you know, Mike and Dean do have the ability to step in. And one of the things we did in the past was if a penalty was called, you could overrule and have that flag picked up, but you couldn't have a flag put on. And this year, in certain instances, we've allowed them to be able to put the flag on, which was an area that we saw. And a lot of this is usually an unsportsmanlike, uh, unnecessary roughness. You know, sometimes in the pace of play and the heat of the battle, something gets missed and all of a sudden the replays start rolling out and you see a punch that was thrown or you see, uh, you know, disrespect to your opponent. And and but still, it, it's patched. You can't put that flag on. We, we've offered the opportunity to be able to do some of those things. Uh, this season. So I, I think we continue to trend that way. Um, you know, Mike and Dean both have their eyes on every snap. Uh, we give our coaches one opportunity during the course of the game um, to challenge anything on that play. And and it was great last week. It happened in the in the San Antonio D.C. game. Um, and they were able to uh, to get a, a touchdown overturned uh, that really flipped that game. Um, and, and it was not called on the field. And you know, Wade and got his staff together and they they looked at it and they they threw the challenge and they they got the call that they wanted to get. Now it's got to be specific. You can't open up the entire play. You've got to be able to go to the to the official and tell him specifically what you want to check on replay. Um, and that worked for us in week one. So th those are some of the areas as we we strive to be as good as you can be when it comes to rules and football and being correct. I think we've added a number of different elements that are getting closer to that point. Do you have to take the call every time Rock calls? If he would call you right now in the middle of our show, are you hanging up on me because The Rock is calling you? I have an, an automatic reply on my phone that says, I can't take your call right now. I'll be back to you as soon as I can, and I'd, I'd give him that one for you, Dan. Oh, I appreciate that, Terrell. It looks like you're in some sort of, for people not watching, but you can watch this on Roku channel, and if you listen on Sirius, it looks like you're in, are you in a club in a, in a clubhouse storage area, in a locker room storage area? I, I am in the heartbeat of the UFL. Uh, we are at the warehouse uh, out in Arlington right now, where where everything is stored. So this is this is where all the the pre magic happens. So everything looks great on the field on Saturdays and Sundays. So out here bothering Anders Butel and and Bobby Monica uh, at the warehouse. So there's tremendous reception there, and I, I'm thinking back to our storage at Marlins Park and thinking about all the stuff that players have, and I'm thinking about your merged league. So I want to now get into that. You're responsible for something. The leagues have had issues. You, you know this. This is not a surprise. Sustainability, profitability. But now it feels like you've set upon a group of cities with a structure that has legs. Is that the feeling inside the front offices and inside the UFL that I think we finally have done it? Yeah, I, I think you make a great point where, you know, th this has been tried in the past. And for, you know, myriad reasons, it, it hasn't been successful I, I think the word that you use, sustainability, um, is is critical. Obviously, profitability; um, th those are the two areas that that we're working really hard on. Um, sustainability. I think the big thing that's happened to me since I got I got involved in spring football back with the Alliance of American Football in 2019, you really had to try and recruit the agents to to convince their players to come play in your league. You know, now we're getting those phone calls from the agents, so I think we've we've developed trust over the last two seasons uh, with the USFL be able, being able to start and finish two regular seasons and crown a champion uh, with the XFL able to complete their regular season last year and crown a champion. Uh, we have shown everybody that that spring football is sustainable. And then for us to come together uh, in the merger and create the UFL and, and really what we've talked to a lot of people about this year is is the talent level that's in this league this year is as good as it's been since the early 80s when the USFL was trying to go head to head with the NFL and you had Reggie White and Steve Young and mm -hmm. Herschel Walker and Doug Flutie and 
you know, those types of players in that league, you know, going from 16 teams down to eight teams, um, you're, you're going from, you know, 800 players down to 400 players. And, you know, we've got guys that were starters last year that are no longer in our league. Uh, starters from last year that are playing backup roles on their teams this year. So we've created a, a higher level of talent. We've created better depth at the key positions, offensive line, quarterback. Um, so that gives you that sustainability. That gives you that quality of play. Now we've got to turn that into the profitability component. Um, it was a it was a good opening weekend. It was Easter weekend. Um, the ratings were good on Saturday. Uh, obviously not as good on Sunday when you talk about the platforms that the broadcasts were on. Um, as opposed to what we had on Saturday. Uh, and then also the fact that it was Easter Sunday. Uh, we had an 11 o'clock kickoff central time. We had a two o'clock kickoff central time. You know, it's hard for the family to get to church and, and have breakfast and go through the Easter baskets and then get out to a football game. But San Antonio was fantastic. Uh, Houston did a really nice job, but we we really need to work on the attendance component. That's going to be a big, a big thing for us moving forward. Uh, we really do feel like the quality of the game will translate in ratings. And now it's just getting that buy-in from our markets to come out and support the home team when we come in on the weekend. Well, you're a tremendous spokesperson for it. But one of the questions that I guess I would ask very simply is, what's the runway like? Because you're talking about attendance, and I had to deal with poor attendance as well, and it was a runway issue. How many years can we fund losses? Because that's why businesses stop is because there's run out of money. What, what's yeah. going on here with the merged entity? Has that given a longer runway? Yeah, we talked about that, the, those myriad reasons why the the other, you know, spring football leagues weren't able to make it. And, and you could look at it for various reasons, but I really do believe it does come down to finances when it's all said and done. You know, even during the course of, you know, the COVID pandemic, you know, that that was really a money decision, you know, at that time in 2020. So um, I, I think what you have to do is you have to look at the landscape and take everything into account. You, you mentioned the eight markets that we're in right now and, you know, how much are they embracing everything and, and how how do we demonstrate that there's profitability there um you know how do the ratings do they continue to climb i think week one is always kind of that curiosity factor you know how many people did we hook uh, on week one uh and get them to tune back in here in week two you know it helps when you have jake bates hit a, a 64 yard field goal twice at the end of the game uh you know that that's awesome in our first week you know to make spring football history um so we, we had a lot of good things going on week one we just we want to be better every single week and what we learned in week one is hey where where did we have our gaps and and can we can we be better in week two and and that's been the charge here for everybody in the ufl we don't expect to be our best in week one but we do expect to be our best in week 10 as we head into the playoffs so let's find those areas where we can get incrementally better every week and and that's going to help prove that this is sustainable that that helps us in our conversations moving forward at the end of the year to find out how much longer we can extend that runway um and and continue to show growth can continue to show profitability and that we're moving in the right direction and and that's going to be the most important thing we won't be great in week one and we weren't uh but when we finish the season we, we've got to be at our best uh, and that gives us leverage going into the off season, uh, you know, to to have something strong as a platform to stand on and and talk about, you know, the length of the runway and moving forward. Do you realize, Daryl, that you just mentioned a 60 plus yard field goal twice as though it was nothing. <laughs> and I was trying to think and TJ, I, I'm thinking about my life as a football fan. And Daryl, I'm curious in your career as well. Has anything changed more from the 90s than the fact that people can kick 50 to 60 yard field goals and we don't even talk about it like, <laughs> like it's <a> nothing? Thing? <laughs> right. I know I, the, the 50 plus yard field goal is commonplace now. I mean, if you can't do that, you can't kick in the NFL. And it, the great story about Jake Bates is that was his first field goal since high school. When he was at Arkansas, he was a kickoff specialist. So he's got a big, strong leg, but they never really let him kick field goals. So uh, you know, this is a huge moment for him. He's got everybody's attention because not only was it the longest field goal in spring football history, but he became one of three professional football players to kick a 64-yard field goal or longer joining Justin Tucker and Matt Prater. And everybody knows who Justin Tucker and Matt Prater are, but nobody really knows who Jake Bates is. So it was a great weekend for him. It was a great weekend to demonstrate what this league is all about. It's it's about opportunity. It's about changing the narrative that the NFL may have on you as a player from your college days. And I think a lot of people might have looked at Jake Bates as, as a kickoff specialist to make sure we're getting that touchback. But with the kickoff rule changing in the NFL, you know, how much – how much value does that carry? Now you're going to want somebody who can be very creative 
with the type of ball flight they have coming off that kickoff, more so than just a big powerful leg that kicks it into the end zone. So, you know, what what Jake Bates did is probably open up the door for him not to be a kickoff guy in the NFL as the summer rolls around, but actually to get into a heated field goal kicking competition with one of the teams in the NFL. Hey, Daryl, it's it's TJ here. I want to say, first of all, congratulations on the success with the UFO and everything going forward. But I'd like to talk to Moose right now, if I could. You know, <laughs> you don't know I happened to meet Daryl. We were going to Vegas for the Super Bowl. I was in the uh, security line. I turned around and he was standing behind me, and I literally just like froze because I'd never met him before. Met Emmett, met Irv, met Troy. I'd never got to meet Moose, so that was a pleasure running into you in the airport that day, sir. So the question being, as a Cowboys fan, can you give me a little bit of hope? Can you, and here we're all in loose, and I know I know you're you're very busy with what you've got going on now, but I, I'm assuming you still have, you know, some boots on the ground, as they say. I heard we're all in. It doesn't appear like we're all in. I need help. I I, I I'm I'm hanging on. You do to need the help. Of the, 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 I'm, I'm, on the, I'm like Hans Gruber and Die Hard. Like I'm hanging on, but at some point I feel like I'm slipping. So give me a reason, if you could, just in all of Cowboy Nation. Give us a reason to hold on. Like, tell me something positive, please. Miss. I need it. I, I got to have it. Sorry, Daryl. Uh, I know. I'm. I'm. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Uh, we were. We were as as gre- We were as as aggressive as we possibly could be in the off season due to salary cap restraints. Um, I, I think it's it, it's going to be one of those processes where we were at, at, at the Big Twelve Pro Day and and I bumped into Will McClay and and just chatted with him for a while. and uh, it it's it's been a hard off season. You know, you, you get into those years where you can't be aggressive. And then there's some players that are out there that that you know can help your team, uh, but you just can't make those moves. and there's there's also, you know, a little bit of a transitional phase going on with the offensive line. And I think that that was always the one constant for Dallas was that offensive line had been great for over a decade. And it looks like they're heading towards a little bit of a transitional phase right now. And how quickly can they get that all patched up? I think going all the way back to like 2008, 2009 around there is is when they realized that if they were going to be competitive, that was where their focus needed to be. And they they had the luxury to to really do a, a tremendous job uh, with their draft, getting guys in and and put together a, a, a tremendous offensive line for over a decade. And, and we're in transition right now. And that's going to be something that they need to get fixed. Uh, I'm interested to, to to just to see the change in the defense. You know, Mike Zimmer coming in and taking over for Dan Quinn. You know, that that's a much different style of defense. It's a different body type that you want on the roster. So how do you transition that, uh, you know, during the course of the offseason when, when you can't make as many moves as you would like to do? So um, I I think for me, Dallas right now is is a really big wait and see. Uh, I, I, you know, there's. There's a lot of movement going on within the division, within the conference, uh, and within the league. And and Dallas is is really kind of been sitting on their hands because they have to. So nothing has really changed. And you can see some of the teams on that landscape that have gotten better. And and one of them is right here, you know, in the state of Texas. There's a lot of chatter about what the Houston Texans are doing, and they're going all in. And, you know, they've got that that ability with C.J. Stroud on that rookie contract. That's when you have to go chase those Super Bowls. You know, they, they did it in Kansas City with Patrick Mahomes. Buffalo was trying to do it with Josh Allen, but they were bumping into Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City. But that's when you have to make your hay. And that's probably for me beyond the the field goal kicker that you talked about. One of the bigger things for me that's been a change. I was never really a window guy that you had this window of opportunity for three years, five years to go win a championship. But as we see the salary of the quarterback continue to rise and really impact what you can do on your roster and all those supporting positions, you do have to have success when that quarterback is on that rookie contract because that's when you're going to be able to get the top quality at all those key positions around the quarterback. And so you can see Houston doing that right now, and they've, they've generated quite a bit of conversation here in the state of Texas. It's Much fascinating, more than the, though. than the Dallas Cowboys have done. But you can't have it both ways because you can win a Super Bowl, you can do it Ram style, win it, and then it's not sustainable. Or you can go all in Dolphin style, not win it, and it's not sustainable. (laughs) But either way, there is no avoiding the window. Hmm. And so having players outperform their contract, Daryl, that has become a much bigger subject. And one of the business parts of the UFL is clearly there is a cap on player expenses. And one of the things is you're managing your league. How often do you talk internally about the cost structure of players as being one of the most important aspects of profitability, but also then wondering 
How do we get around it if we can get a big time player to come play in this league? Yeah, that's that's one of the big ones that we wrestle with. And and I've seen it work, you know, in different ways in, in some of the other leagues that we were in in the springtime and you had a quote unquote marquee contract um, and, and you offer that out and the player underperforms or the player gets hurt. Um, and now you've either got somebody who's on the sideline with a bigger contract and the guy who's got the standard contract is out on the field playing lights out. So th there's always a risk to doing that. So, you know, I, I, I really have enjoyed just kind of our standard contract across the board, um, you know, to get the type of players, whether it's the offensive line, the quarterback, the edge rusher, do we have to take a look at that model? Do we have to adjust that model? If so, what's our ceiling when we talk about salary pool uh, across, you know, eight teams and, and 50 players? Uh, when we talk about sustainability and profitability, a lot of that goes into expenses. And, and that's one of the things that we have to be very careful about. Um, so that that's something that I know a lot of us talked about because it was something that existed in the XFL uh, to a small degree, but we did not do that in the USFL uh, we tried that year one, um, and and it didn't work out the way we had hoped. So in year two, we pulled back and just went standard across the board. I like to do it on the back end. I like to do it merit-based. Let's reward the players from the regular season who were the star players of our league and give them a merit-based financial reward as opposed to something that's going to lure them into our league so a lot of different ways to look at it uh, that's but, epic but hoping that we can stay with that merit-based formula because I, I really want to reward the guys who believed in what our vision was came to play in our league uh became very good football players here for us and, and played at a very high level giving bonuses to players based on what they've done to deserve them that is epic novel daryl thank you so much the Executive Vice President of Football Operations for UFL. If you have not checked out a game, uh, you're silly because spring football, A, you get your football fix, yep. and B, it is quite quality football. Daryl, thank you for joining the Rich Eisen Show with me. You are welcome. And one more with your movie thing. Robin Williams, as a dramatic actor, is very, very undervalued. I know he's a great comedian, but Goodwill Hunting, Dead Poets Society... Uh, there's there's so many good films with Robin Williams as, as a dramatic. There's actor. so many. Will yeah. Ferrell, the same. Underrated. Yes, exactly. Right. Great. Oh, I, we could talk movies for a whole. Maybe you'll come on Nothing Personal and we'll just do movies together. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you so much. Thanks, Moose. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free.